<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome to everyone in the room, and hello to people joining us on Zoom. Um, welcome to the 21st annual faculty research lectureship in clinical science. My name is Vanessa Jacoby. I'm a professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences, and I'm the vice chair of the Academic Senate Committee on Research, which sponsors this lectureship. This award recognizes exceptional career achievement in clinical science. The Senate also hosts the Faculty Research Lectureship in Basic Science, which happens in the spring. And in the spring, please look for the call for nominations, which will be in three categories this year, Basic Science, Clinical Science, and Behavioral, Social, and Health Policy Science. Nominations for this award are made by UCSF faculty who aim to recognize the significant scientific contributions of their colleagues. And the Academic Senate Committee on Research reviews all the nominations. Many of them are on Zoom, I know. So I just want to thank the committee for the hours of work it takes to review many of these amazing nominations. Today, we are extremely honored to have the opportunity to recognize Dr. Diane Havlier. Dr. Havlier is a professor of medicine and chief of the HIV Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine Division at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And she's the vice chair of research for the UCSF Department of Medicine. Dr. Havlier was nominated by Dr. Stephen Deeks who is also a professor of medicine in her division. And in his nomination letter, Dr. Deeks proposed that Dr. Havlier should receive not one, but two awards today. I'm quoting, one for her groundbreaking work in HIV medicine dating back to the 1990s, and one for her vision and leadership in guiding the successful UCSF clinical response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In his nomination, Dr. Deeks highlighted many of Dr. Havlier's scientific accomplishments, and his overall conclusion was that scientifically, quote, Diane is always light years ahead of everyone else. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Deeks, who will officially introduce Dr. Havlier. Um, yeah, no, I really meant that. Thank, thank you, Vanessa. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to show my a few slides here. Hopefully this will work. Um, yeah, so sorry, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm in Miami at our, at our annual meeting, probably the most important meeting of the year. So I have to be here and I can't be there with you guys, but I'm thrilled that I can introduce Diane. Um, and she's gonna go ahead and tell, I think, the story about how she has over the past 15 years or so been using community outreach um, in her search for the end of AIDS. But, you know, part of the story is also work that she's been doing to um, um, find an end to the COVID-19. We'll talk about that. But, but when you listen to how she presents this, and it took me a while to sort of understand what she was really up to, but Diane has got... <laughs> Big ambitions here. She's she's trying to stop the AIDS a, a, um, pandemic in Africa and locally here in San Francisco. Same with COVID. At the same time, building up what I think is a whole new way of doing of delivering medicine with really robust, deep engagement with the community in a way that I think ultimately may allow everyone globally to begin to address lots of issues um, in terms of um, chronic disease and so forth. So it's an amazing story. Um, I will not steal her thunder. I just want to sort of give some background. So um, one of my favorite parts of Diane's story, of course, is the fact that she was a um, national champion as a speed skater back when she was young in high school and in her college years. Um, and I think that says a lot about her focus and energy and drive. Um, she trained at UCSF. Uh, did some of her early training in the 1980s in San Francisco. Obviously got um, um, inspired by what was happening then in terms of the HIV and AIDS response. She eventually ended up at UC San Diego and in the 1990s, I think did some of the most innovative 
creative experimental medicine of that decade using antiretroviral drugs as a way to sort of probe how HIV and the immune system interact in a way that was quite impactful and thoughtful and very innovative. And so when she came to San Francisco in 2002, I figured that she would continue to do the same. She was very, very good at it. In fact, probably the best in the business. Um, but she had different plans. And probably the earliest evidence of this was this meeting that happened, I don't know, probably two or three years after she showed up where Diane assembled um, members of our team at Ward 86, members of public health system, lots of primary care providers in the city, academics and so forth to come together and really to have a consensus that we were gonna treat HIV very aggressively in San Francisco. We we're gonna put everyone on antiretroviral drugs immediately, which was really um, groundbreaking at the time. And of course, a few years later became standard of care globally. But that was the first inclination of where Diane was actually going to use her vision, bring the community together, public health, academics, everybody, all the stakeholders um, to begin to tackle some of the biggest problems. And I believe, I'm sure she's gonna go through what she did in terms of developing um, with Susan Buckbinders and others, the Getting to Zero um, initiative, which was really a sort of a, a very um, robust response within San Francisco to expand prevention, um, uh, to really basically drive down the number of HIV infections as close as possible to zero. Quite successful. I'm sure she'll tell us exactly how it worked out. Um, and then, and, and what, what still sort of blows my mind, and I never quite figured out how she did this, um, she basically put together, collected a bunch of um, experts uh, in, in global health in San Francisco, but primarily in East Africa, um, really engaged the East African community, the academic community, um, and put together the search program, which she will talk about, which enrolled a remarkable 350,000 people into a, into a clinical trial, a randomized clinical trial, addressing a number of issues. And, and this program was very, very successful, impact on, on international guidelines, and has now been built into a series of subsequent studies. Um, and of course, all this made Diane absolutely perfect to help respond in a very deep way in terms of what happened COVID-19. So from the get-go, um, she was working with um, uh, colleagues from the Latino task force to sort of develop an academic and community and public health based uh, response to COVID, also quite successful. Um, she's a master communicator. She is very, very focused on making sure that, that science is disseminated. She organized the AIDS 2012 International Conference, which, has, which was and remains the largest HIV conference, and I think the most successful conference ever done. Um, and was a tremendous success in terms of disseminating information. Um, she's been a mentor to many, many generations of academic leaders, um, and um, um, both back in the 1990s and all the way up to the present. Um, and of course, I mean, her academic credentials, right? Most of us, I think we get judged based on our papers. Diane does not, she's doing much bigger, important things. But in case if you wanna know whether or not she's been academically successful, she has indeed. This is just a list of her papers um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Seems like every couple of years, um, Diane is actually having a major contribution in, 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 in such a highly impactful forum. Um, and finally, I, I do have to mention um, that Diane has an amazing family a loving husband. I bump into Diane and Art periodically on the streets. They look like two people madly in love and they, they have four very uh, wonderful children. And I just heard, learned that she actually now has a grandchild as of three months ago. So I can't imagine anyone who is more um, deserving of this award. And um, I'm happy to be part of this. And over to you, Diane.
friends, her love for learning, her love for colleagues is really a gift that she gave to all of us. So, um, I, yes. I guess I think Sue is having problems sharing. So Sorry. I'm, I'm going to keep talking for our in-person audience. Um, uh, the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Chu said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And today I'm going to share with you one person's journey along with um, my incredible team um, of our uh, journey to end HIV. So step one of the journey, run towards the fire. I was a very naive medical student, and, but really an ID geek at that time even, and I would always read the MMWR. I love to read it, and I remember reading um, the first reports of AIDS, and I called up the head of ID, and I said, if you hadn't seen any of these cases, I called up the CDC and said, can I work at the CDC this summer? And actually, the CDC said yes. And for the summer, I fielded phone calls from doctors calling in from all over the country of cases that they thought were AIDS. Fortunately, um, I matched at UCSF for my residency. I really wanted to come here. So I jumped in my Honda Civic. I drove across the country to my apartment in Noe Valley and was smack dab in the middle of the um, AIDS pandemic. And at that time, San Francisco was an epicenter. And the senior people, looking back, were really quite junior. Here you can see um, Paul Voverding and uh, Dion Jones, uh, a very, very dear colleague. Um, but at this time, um, I was realizing my dreams of becoming a physician, and it was not lost on me that these all these young men were dying and their dreams were being crushed. And it was really at this moment I knew what I wanted to commit my career to. So San Francisco set what I would say is a construct for pandemic response at that time, a construct that can work. And that construct is, construct is bringing together science, policymakers, and community. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the community. The community brings face to a disease, they bring, they're a force for funding and they really have been in HIV. And they can be a force at the FDA when we're trying to get access of medications for our patients. Now, in order for this three-legged stool to work, a couple things need to happen. People need to be, get out of their comfort zone. And it's really amazing when one thinks about the science that our community members have learned. We need to understand the pressures that politicians face. And um, what people need to do is to listen and they need to come up with common goals, even though everyone's facing own pressures in their own silo they're working in. And if this can happen, you can really have an effective pandemic response. So starting the first, I would say decade in HIV as a clinical researcher, what we had was we, we basically had opportunistic infections. So we did clinical trials to prevent those opportunistic infections or treat them. Uh, one of the opportunistic infections that I worked on was mycobacterium avian complex, previously a completely obscure bacteria that we never really saw. But in the milieu of um, the immune system and people living with HIV, it just completely took off and wreaked havoc, causing fever, chills, wasting. And this um, was often the precursor, sadly, to death in many patients with AIDS. So we designed a very large clinical trial over 1,000 patients. We compared the antibiotic azithromycin given once a week um, uh, to not getting prophylaxis. And sure enough, it worked. It reduced mycobacterium avium complex, but we were really just scratching the surface. And there were many opportunistic infections such as Kaposi's sarcoma for which we really didn't have anything to, to offer our patients. So this brings us to the second flight of stairs, understand and treat the virus. And this to me was all about the laboratory scientists, laboratory science, scientists in academia, at the NIH, and in industry, because what they did was they defined the structure of the virus, they described the life cycle of the virus, and this allowed them to identify targets to block um, replication in the virus. Now, as a clinical researcher, we were just banging on the doors of laboratory investigators. When are you gonna have some drugs for us to use um, for this disease? And actually it happened um, quite quickly. So the first target um, in HIV therapy was the hallmark enzyme of HIV, which is reverse transcriptase. 
Now, reverse transcriptase builds DNA strains um, from an RNA template. And this is a 3D structure of reverse transcriptase. It looks a little bit like a palm. Um, the active site is in, um, that looks like a hand. The active site of the enzyme is in the palm. And um, uh, James Hargreave, a uh, medicinal chemist at Behringer Engelheim, designed the drug nevirapine, which fit right around that pocket. Um, and it caused a, conform uh, a conformational change um, to render the enzyme inactive. So in other words, it was allosteric um, inhibition. So um, Steve talked about this a little bit. The, we did a whole series of studies looking at viral dynamics um, when we provided this new drug, nevirapine, to our patients. And what we saw very uniformly was within a period of two weeks, there was a two-log reduction in the HIV um, uh, levels. And this reflected the fact that um, HIV um, replicates very, very quickly and untreated patients, um, cells produce a billion particles a day. So um, this was at least exciting that we saw this reduction, but then we saw this um, rapid increase in viral load and we called this the check mark. And we hypothesized that the check mark probably was due to escape of drug resistant virus. And that in fact was the case in some studies we did, some translational studies, we showed that was true for nevirapine. We estimated the number of pre-existing drug resistant mutants. Now, uh, one of the survival tactics of HIV, not only does it produce a huge amount of virus, it's very sloppy when it replicates. And you might think that, oh, that's not good, but actually it's very good for the virus because when it's sloppy and it replicates, it produces essentially Newton's resistance to all the drugs we'd ever think of using. So people have pre-existing drug-resistant mutants. So when you give them monotherapy, you select for these drug-resistant mutants and they rapidly emerge. So what's shown here on the lower left, uh, remember drawing this figure, and we, I drew this figure to illustrate where we were in HIV and where we needed to go. So we had one drug therapy, two drug therapies, but we kept on seeing the check mark because we would see these um, escape drug resistant mutants. And what we needed to do was we needed to get higher potency. And that was either gonna be by the individual drugs or by combining drugs together in order to achieve viral suppression. I mean, in a lot of ways, this was just a really a theoretical concept, but this seemed like where we needed to go. This actually happened pretty quickly. Um, in the mid nineties on the upper right is uh, a graph which shows um, a study that we published in New England Journal where we combined um, three drugs together. One inhibited the HIV enzyme protease, two of the drugs inhibited reverse transcriptase. And we compared and we looked at the viral load levels in patients who got one, two or three drugs. Now I can remember the day the hour, the actual fax machine, when these data came across, because this was so exciting. And I thought to myself, everything in HIV is going to change. And it did. <laughs> and on the lower, um, the, the figure on the lower right uh, of the slide shows the, the, the purple diamonds are in this cohort, the, the number of persons who are put on this triple drug antiretroviral therapy, and then the black boxes show the reduction in mortality. And this was just simply amazing. So one of the things also is this uh, rendered the work that we had done previously in a lot of ways not very relevant because antiretroviral therapy was so much better in preventing opportunistic infections than all these antibiotics that we were doing to prevent um, these diseases. So this was great but we had a number of challenges. And uh, the first one was high pill burden. These are the actual drugs that we used in the study that I showed you. And this was a brutal regimen for the patients. They had to take drugs three times a day. There were a total of 14 pills. And because one of the drugs had a side effect of kidney stones, we needed to recommend to our patients drink water all day, all day which means they peed all night. So this was a really, really difficult regimen. Um, our regimens were also um, associated with toxicity. Here's a picture of nevirapine, the drug I showed you. One of the complications of nevirapine is Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which you can see here. And then the drugs through a mechanism we still have not completely figured out today. These combinations of these regimens called cause body habitus changes. You can see some of the pictures here that were 
very stigmatizing for patients. So not only did we have high pill, 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 pill burden, we had a lot of toxicity. These drugs cost about twenty to $30,000 per year. If you're saving a life, I'm not sure I think that that's expensive, but that was the cost of these drugs. And um, for reasons that I shared with you, if people did not take these regimens exactly how we prescribed, they selected for drug-resistant mutants. And in fact, this really created a whole decade where we were chasing drug-resistant mutants because it was really difficult for our patients to take these um, uh, very intense regimens. So at this time, there were two really important questions um, um, that were asked um, and that I think really dictated where we went, where the we concentrated our efforts in the clinical wor world. And the first one, um, we had characterized um, the, the viral decay. Um, there's different cellular reservoirs for the virus. So there was a phase one, a phase two, a phase three decay. What the question was, well, after phase three decay, are we going to um, extinguish the virus? And that would have been like, oh, well, HIV is only a three-year disease, you know, once we start these um, regimens. Well, that was not the case. And um, uh, my colleague, uh, Joe Wong and I, who's a professor here at UCSF, um, we were, uh, we had worked together ever since the beginning of AIDS there. And um, what he showed in some very elegant laboratory studies that um, treatment does not equal cure and that, what, yes, indeed, you can find replication competent HIV in cells, even in the setting of suppression of virus after a couple of years. So what that meant is we were going to need to have patients on these complex regimens, at least probably for decades. So I'm a pragmatist. So I had another hypothesis. My hypothesis was, well, okay, if we get the viral load down um, to low levels, maybe we can keep it suppressed by using one or two drugs. So we designed the strategy called induction maintenance. And what we did was we randomized people to one, two, or, or three drugs to see if we could maintain suppression, not have people not having to take all those 14 pills. Well, DSMB called, stopped the study. This was a big fail, immediately saw the, uh, the check mark. It was on the front page of the New York Times, maintenance uh, therapy fails. But we all know in science, um, a failure is not really a failure if you design the experiment appropriately. It tells you that you um, need to redirect. So what we needed to do was, and this happened in HIV, we needed to get a much better generation of drugs um, that were easier to take and uh, that had less toxicity. And that happened, we did lots of trials comparing different regimens. Um, one regimen really emerged to the top of fabrins and two non-nucleosides. And then, um, and this was really very exciting when the pharmaceutical um, industry um, worked to co-formulate the pills. And so what we ended up having really in a relatively short time period was we could combine three drugs into one pill. And then we had treatments for HIV, which we called single pill uh, combination regimens. And this, of course, not only increased adherence, but it reduced drug resistance. Now, I think the only time in the history of the New England Journal, there was an article that was written by a brother-sister combination. You may know these people, Monica and Raj Gandhi, and they wrote a beautiful review article about how important these single pill combination regimens were for the treatment um, of of HIV. So here we are now, we've got one pill once a day, we can transform a uniformly fatal disease um, into a chronic disease, um, but only people in essentially high income countries are receiving uh, this drug and they represent a small proportion of all the people at this time living with HIV. And there were over 30 million people with HIV, nobody in low income countries um, receiving antiretroviral therapy. And we absolutely knew that we needed to address this. So um, the, the International um, AIDS Society, and Steve mentioned this, every two years gathers. It's a very unique meeting. It brings together uh, government officials, ministers of health, um, the community and scientists all come together to take stock of where we at in the AIDS response. So to me, probably one of the most important international AIDS conferences was in 2000. The theme of the conference was break the silence. Now, I was on the organizing committee of this conference, and at the time, the president of South Africa, Mbeki, uh, was putting forth very forcefully that HIV does not cause AIDS. So we went into uh, the crises room, and we said, well, should we really do the conference? If the president is saying HIV doesn't cause AIDS, and we went back and forth, back and forth, ultimately the decision was to support the conference going forward. And I think history would have changed if we would, have, would not have done that. And this is a picture. Um, and this uh, uh, really is, uh, uh, 
it chokes me up really to look at this picture because I remember um, Nkosi, the late Nkosi Johnson, a young boy who was infected um, from birth with HIV um, in this uh, suit coat, in his jeans. The opening session was under the stars, outdoors at this conference, gave one of the most moving speeches ever. And at the end, he said, how come I can't get access to this therapy? And I think this really motivated the whole AIDS community to uh, start to try to tackle this problem. Now, I'm summarizing here in the slide that I'm calling the trail to scale, ART, a couple of important points. So if you look on the lower left-hand picture, um, this was a picture um, that was in the New England Journal and a clinical report. Um, this um, young man um, who was living in Haiti had both HIV and tuberculosis. This is what he looked like before he started antiretroviral therapy. And then you can see what he looked like a year later after he finished his TB treatment. He was on antiretroviral therapy. Um, his wife had a child that was not HIV um, infected. I mean, this is truly a Lazarus effect and it was very powerful and people were starting to see this. Um, there's two people, I don't think we would have seen the progress we had, both who um, have in our faculty at UCSF that made major contributions to this. The first is Sir, Sir, Sir Richard Feacham, who started the Global Fund. The Global Fund is a multilateral organization um, that um, gives out um, billions of dollars every year to mitigate HIV, TB, and malaria. And they do it in a very strict accountability way. If you can't show how you're spending money, it's making a difference, um, you're not going to get more money. And this was really just a complete breakthrough in global health. Um, uh, the former President Bush started PEPFAR, and um, the um, ambassador during this time of PEPFAR, um, appointed by the president, um, worked in the State Park Department as Eric Goosby, and Eric really um, catalyzed the rollout of antiretroviral therapy in low-income countries. Now, um, I am from the uh, very beginning of uh, uh, treatment. I have been really had the opportunity to serve on the WHO treatment guidelines. And I must say every single meeting that we have, it's a, uh, we have lots of discussion and debate. But when um, antiretroviral therapy, the, after this meeting in Durban, um, people said, well, what are we going to recommend for countries around the world with antiretroviral therapy? You know, people were dying. There was a treatment that could prevent that. And um, in this discussion and debate, there were really two camps. There was the aspirational camp that said, it's not, um, are we going to do that? It's how we're going to do that. And then there was like the acquiescence camp. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's humbling. Like we all have so many blind spots when we think of global health. And there were ministers of health um, at this meeting. And they said, are you really going to tell us that the guidelines are that we need to treat patients? We don't have electricity. We don't have running water. We have such a high, high child mortality rate. Are you going to shame us and make this guideline and say that we need to treat people? And then there were people living with HIV. And this is, this is why this three-legged this three -legged stool is so important from the very countries and said, how can you not provide access to this treatment for us? And then the ministers of health was, how are we going to afford it if it's you know, $30,000 a year? But um, I was in the aspiration camp. I'm sure you're not surprised. Um, we won out and we made this target of um, treating uh, 3 million people by 2005. Now, we failed to meet the target by 2005, but we met it by 2008. And I think this just shows the power when you bring together science, policymakers, and community. So now, I'm going to talk about 2010. So when we rolled out antiretroviral therapy, um, we only gave it to people who had AIDS. Okay. If you so the natural history of HIV is you get infected on average, it takes 10 years um, before you your T cells are 200 and you start getting all the kind of hallmark opportunistic infections. So the people in the uh, who had been infected and hadn't started getting um, uh, their T cells had dropped, um, they weren't eligible for treatment. Now these these were the rationale at this time. First of all, that antiretroviral therapy has more toxicity than than the complications of the disease. Secondly, persons without symptoms will never take their medications. And third, we cannot afford to treat all persons um, with HIV. Now, I, I've always learned that you really need to listen to arguments because there's always some truth in some of these arguments. 
But really, there were already a lot of data um, that argued um, against this particular case that was being made. First of all, the drugs were a lot less toxic than people were saying at this time. But I want to review a couple of those with you. First of all, is that from the onset of disease and the, the group that really championed this, this was Steve Deeks and two of the people he mentored, Peter Hunt, who's sitting here um, with us today, and Priscilla Shu, the concept that HIV causes immune dysregulation and it causes this inflammatory state, that that is way worse than antiretroviral side effects. And it's not just about be people being susceptible <laughs> to opportunistic infections. This immune dysregulation and inflammation causes organ damage. And if we treat people with antiretroviral therapy, we can reverse this. Now, this was corroborated in a clinical trial. When this was first brought up, there was a lot of pushback. But this is just one other argument of why we should be starting treatment from the onset of disease. Then there was this landmark study in HIV that demonstrated um, that antiretroviral therapy um, reduces forward transmission. Now, we knew antiretroviral prevented mother-child transmission. If you reduce the viral levels, it's certainly not surprising that you could uh, uh, minimize transmission. Um, but in the study that was um, hailed on Science Magazine as the breakthrough of the year, HIV discordant couples with high T cells were randomized. Um, the HIV infected person either received antiretroviral therapy or not, and forward transmission was reduced um, dramatically. So this showed not only can people who are asymptomatic um, take medications, but it was a two for one. Um, I had been involved in HIV and TB research um, for quite a while at that point, and um, there were arguments to make it. People have TB, you shouldn't start antiretroviral therapy. It's too complicated. They, can, they won't be able to take the therapy. It's really not needed. You need to treat the TB. Now, this really made no sense to me because TB, for example, activates cells and cells in order to be infected and replicate need activation. So um, people with TB are activating cells. They're susceptible to all sorts of infections. They're already telling you the immune system is impaired. Why would you not start antiretroviral therapy? So in order to prove this or look at it, we conducted a randomized study. Um, Andy, Andy Lukemeyer um, was a participant in the study, a young investigator. And uh, yes, indeed, that if you start antiretroviral therapy early in persons with TB, they can take it and you will, versus delaying it, you will cut AIDS and death. Um, a short time after, um, not in a randomized trial, but really with the same principles, Lawrence Wong, who's sitting here in the audience, and I um, wrote a piece in the New England Journal talking about the importance and the power of using antiretroviral therapy in this other setting, the intensive um, care unit. So, so we were armed with data, but honestly, I'm going to call this, we had what was something I would call the ethical pushback. And this is that ART is not cost effective. Now this was published in Science in 2010. And what this figure is, it graphs out um, cost effectiveness of some global health interventions, um, bed nets, tobacco tax, uh, BCG vaccine. And what you can see, uh, see in this um, figure is antiretroviral therapy falls at the very uh, bottom. Now, I think, um, as Thinking about global health investments is a zero sum game. Sure, we can't waste resources. We don't have unlimited resources, but I would argue if you do that, you essentially have zero chance to introduce new interventions like antiretroviral therapy. So it was at this time, I have to diverge a little bit. I had what I call my Max Peretz moment. I don't know how many of you know Max Peretz. He was awarded the Nobel prize for defining the structure of hemoglobin. But Max Peretz also edited a book, um, and uh, it was a book of essays. Um, it's called I Wish I Made You Angry Earlier. Now, I was um, a co-chair of the International AIDS Conference, and which was um, for the first time in decades being held in Washington, D.C. Steve uh, Deeks had mentioned this, um, and that was because the United States finally lifted, can you believe, this a ban on people with HIV entering the United States. And we would have uh, meetings in the White House um, frequently. And one of the persons that I would meet with is Dr. Zeke Emanuel. He is a powerhouse in American medicine. And I had this meeting with him. And uh, I'm sure he doesn't remember this meeting. But I remember this meeting because he quoted this paper. And he said, why are you pushing to treat everybody? You should be pushing for all these other um, uh, health interventions. And 
this made me very angry. <laughs> and I am not of the stature of the essays are in Max Perrin's book, but all these essays I could totally relate to. Either it was a colleague that said something or something that they read that really motivated them to buckle down and try to disprove this. So what I realized, first of all, our communication was inadequate. We needed to look at antiretroviral therapy in a much broader framework. We were just looking at in terms of death two days. Of course, that's important, but we knew antiretroviral therapy did so much more. It reduced new, reduces new HIV infections. It reduces maternal deaths and infant mortality, reduces TB. And we would think that it would help keep kids in school, have parents support their family, reduce food insecurity. So um, uh, these concepts, uh, a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins and I, uh, Chris Beyer, put forth in a perspective we wrote at this time at the International AIDS Conference, which um, we entitled The Beginning of Ends of AIDS. Now, we got, got a lot of pushback when we wrote this editorial, but that's never really held me back. And so here we go. This is, we went back to thinking about what San Francisco did early on in the pandemic, bring together science, policy, and community. So here I am on the next flight of stairs, and many of the uh, uh, search team members are in the room here. What we wanted to do was to prove the population level benefit, prove or disprove the population ben level benefit of antiretroviral therapy. So um, and I reached out. Um, uh, there's three of us that form the search collaboration. My colleague, um, Dr. Moses Kamya, who across the Atlantic really had gone through um, a similar journey um, with AIDS. Uh, Dr. Kami is a former chairman of medicine and dean, an expert in HIV, TB, and malaria, along with the brilliant biostatistician, uh, Maya, Maya Peterson, who is um, now um, uh, co-leading the new UCSF uh, Joint uh, Center uh, with Ida Sims for Computational Precision Health. And we brought together a multidisciplinary, multi-sector um, group. Um, we called it SEARCH, Sustainable East Africa Research and Community Health. And the goal of SEARCH is to test bold population-level interventions to end AIDS and improve community health. And we wanted to do that to inform policymakers on high-impact interventions. And we also wanted to build capacity in science. We fortunately had um, very strong support from the National Institutes of Health and also um, from PEPFAR. So when we were designing this study, we did have to do a lot of pitches. We made field trips to the NIH, um, the, uh, the World Bank, um, PEPFAR, Ministries of Health of Uganda and Kenya. And this was the case that we were making, that if we expanded ART and we coupled it with multi-disease patient-centered delivery models, this would lead to smaller and less ill epidemic populations and improve and protect the health and productivity of the community. And we used this cartoon when we made our pitch. And what this cartoon shows is it's color coded. Green is T cells are high, they're over um, 500. Red is, is bad, T cells are low. And this is when all the opportunistic infections are. But we said, what we're doing in the HIV response right now is we're waiting for people to fall into the red zone and then we're rescuing them. I showed you those pictures. Well, what we should be doing instead is finding people in the green zone, treating people in the green zone and keeping them healthy. And we had pretty decent drugs um, when we were designing the study, study. So we made the case, we need to test a strategy, not a treatment. So all the work we do is in true uh, community partnerships. We can never do what we do without a community. From the first time we had this idea, we met with the community, we met with local government leaders, you, women, youth, men, um, and um, our community partners have always provided input on our priorities, our incentives, our study design. And maybe just to give you one example, um, at this time, um, HIV testing. So uh, globally HIV, people about only 30 to 40%, can you imagine this, people all around the world actually knew they were HIV infected. So this was like a big problem. And the people who would, who would find out they're HIV infected was when they ended up in the hospital. But the way this was being done is, at least in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, there were big signs, come and get HIV testing, completely stigma producing. You know, if you go there, everybody knows kind of about your business. So we worked with the community and we said, well, we think we wanna do multi-diseases. They said, that's great. And um, we said, well, what diseases would you want to do? So they said, well, we want to do pressure or test for high blood pressure. And we want to do um, diabetes. We said, oh, 
we can do that. And um, so not only does bringing multi-disease into it um, reduce stigma, it also is demand generation creating, right? Because if people that really don't want to get HIV tested, I think they probably should, but they do want to get their blood pressure checked. So um, the community was simply amazing. Um, when we do our work, we are way in the background. It's the community that's completely out front and lots of problems. I can tell you come up when you do these large studies, it's not the researchers, we're not the ones that solve the problems, it's the community leaders that do, because they have the most credibility with the community or the law, in fact, if that is, uh, is, that is the case. So this was our large study, um, our first study, Search 1.0, that we designed. Our hypothesis was HIV test and treat, um, test everyone and treat everyone with HIV using a multi-disease patient-centered approach would reduce new infections and improve community health and productivity. We conducted the study in rural areas in Uganda and Kenya, 32 communities of 10,000 persons each, large study. And we randomized um, at the baseline, we tested everybody using uh, this multi-disease and these tents and every single place we tested, it looked different. And um, at the end of three years, we looked at endpoints related to HIV and to um, overall health. So in order for this to work, we had to um, uh, determine if we could test everybody. And um, I'm um, and at this when we were starting search, um, John Cohen, who is a journalist who writes for the Science Magazine, and PBS um, reached out and asked if they could um, come visit and watch what we were doing. And so we talked to the community, and they said yes, we we would like to have these visitors. So um, uh, John Cohen, uh, for those of you who watch the PBS NewsHour, um, Will Branham um, and their crew um, uh, uh, came out. We had to take a boat because we went to one of our sites, which was um, Enfangano Island, which is on Lake Victoria, um, for them to really experience of what we were doing. And I'm going to show you a clip from um, the documentary that they did. And then also, I have to say, they were such crusaders. Um, we also went out night with the fishermen on Lake Victoria because they just really wanted to understand this lifestyle. The 30% the of people in this community were already HIV infected. So this was a very um, uh, a community that was really experiencing the burden of HIV and a lot of death due to HIV. So let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, this is a very short video. This is what state-of-the-art HIV care and prevention in Kenya looks like. You set up your testing team, not in a clinic, but right next to the water. You do it at night because that's when the fishermen are coming home. You get a band to play, you give away prizes. What we have done in order to have a place where people want to go test has made it accessible to them. So um, um, this worked. We were able to um, uh, test um, essentially nearly all the population. And um, two of the people who were absolutely critical to the effort are sitting here in the audience, Gabe Shamey and Vivek Jane. And it was really amazing along with Doug Black, Tamara Clark and Edwin Chalawa and our international colleagues. On the left, you can see a heat, we did heat maps. Um, red is, uh, uh, you don't know your status, um, or the large proportion of people don't know their status. Yellow is uh, a substantial, don't know their status. And what you can see is over a period of two years, those colors completely disappear. Um, we costed that out. The cost was similar to other programs or even less. And once you set up the structure, adding hypertension to your diabetes really does not cost that much money. So testing is not enough. And what we knew that we had to do was link people to care and then get them on treatment to achieve viral suppression. So at this time, Michelle Sidibi um, is a non-scientist, but uh, I would consider a brilliant health diplomat. Um, he was um, having meetings um, uh, where he would invite scientists, and I was part of this, clinical scientists, laboratory scientists who were generating data um, related to antiretroviral therapy and community members, and brought us together. And what he do is like, explain to me what's happened, explain to me the science, and then, then he would explain it back to us. And then we would say, oh, it's a little bit like this, but he was such an effective communicator. And he's like, I want to convince people that we need to treat everyone, and I want to set some ambitious targets. So we went back and forth, and then as a result of this, I would, I think, probably one of the most successful 
treatment or public health campaigns in HIV was launched. And it was called 909090. And you can go to some of the most remote places on the planet of people who work in HIV, and they will tell you about 909090. And in fact, I've gone to places and they said to me, have you heard about 909090? When people do that, it just makes me so happy. So what 909090 is, to ask countries to achieve 90% of the people know their HIV status, 90% of the people are in treatment, and 90% have viral suppression. Now, if you do your math, that ends up being a population suppression rate around 70%, which isn't going to be enough, um, but that's much better than how we were doing. So we had already started, really, our path to 9090 in search, and two years into our study, we published that we had, in fact, exceeded, um, uh, this was published by Maya Peterson and JAMA, the 9090 uh, uh, 90 targets. It, this is really a proof of principle. So these are some graphs from uh, uh, the three-year uh, final results of our study, and I just want to share uh, some of the main findings from the study. Viral suppression was higher in the intervention versus control. This shows that HIV incidence reductions in the intervention arm. Um, these were greater in men than women, uh, partially contributing to that, but we were more successful in suppressing um, the virus in women than in men. Um, Ted Bruel looked at mother-to-child transmission. We saw 50% reduction in mother-to-child transmission, 28% reduction in HIV mortality, um, a 60% reduction in HIV-associated TB. And um, we saw some really profound effects on hypertension. Now, we took people's blood pressure. We recommended that they go to the clinic. But unlike HIV, we didn't really have structured incentive programs. But even with this, at a population level, we saw a reduction um, in mortality after three years, which is a really short time period. And when we looked at individuals who came in with stage three hypertension, this was, there was a 39% reduction in mortality. Now, um, Matt Hickey um, just received a CAID grant and he's being mentored um, uh, with our team and alongside Kirsten Bivens Domingo was really following up on this really um, exciting uh, finding. So um, we, we sought out to uh, show that there were societal benefits from the study. And in fact, that was true. Um, our behavioral uh, economist, um, who has several uh, R01s with Gabe Shamey, uh, what we showed from this study that yes, indeed, when you treat people early, you find them and keep them in the green zone, that they, they can stay employed, that they have lower health costs and their kids stay in school. Um, Starley Shade, hi Starley, who is also here, um, did some really, really um, nice costing studies along with Vivek Jain on treatment and that they showed that our patient-centered care models was um, similar in cost or lower than the standard of care. And it really does not cost that much more, once again, when you add a disease such as hypertension. Uh, Carol Camlin has just been an extraordinary social scientist as part of our team and has published a, a, a whole series of papers on really the behaviors and the demographics and the mobility of um, patients during the study. So here we are, um, Search was, um, one of the pieces that contributed to the current global standard, antiretroviral therapy for all persons with HIV at the time of diagnosis, um, patient-centered care. I haven't showed you the data with this, but investigators in San Francisco really did the first studies of pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is when you take um, um, antiretroviral therapy um, because you're at risk to get HIV, you don't yet have it, um, or you've been exposed to HIV, we call post-exposure prophylaxis um, or PEP. So these are the, the interventions, um, some of the main interventions we have. Um, we've put over 25 million people on therapy globally, which is amazing, but there's still 10 million people that are not on therapy. And with all these advances, there still are 4,000 new HIV diagnoses every day globally and one HIV death a minute. So this year, the UNAIDS, when they put out the report, the title of the report was In Danger, Progress to End AIDS is Slowing, Not Accelerating. And sure, COVID contributed to this, but it really was not the entire reason. So the question now is, how do we bend the curve? Because if we keep doing what we're doing, we are not going to meet our targets. So this brings us to Search 2.0. And um, after Search 1.0, um, we put together a proposal um, that we submitted to the NIH. And our question was, can a precision community health approach that use 21st century technology and new products move us closer to ending AIDS and improving overall health? So um, our answer from NIH was yes and no. Um, they were supportive of the uh, question we wanted to ask, but they said, no, you cannot jump into a large population level study. This was true because you're proposing things that you really have not done sufficient pilot studies on. So first you need to do the pilot studies. 
So this, in a lot of ways, was a blessing in disguise because COVID happened right at this time. And I don't think we could have launched a huge population study and responded to COVID at the same time. But remarkably, with our partners on the ground who did so much work, we conducted six and completed six randomized studies with over a thousand patients. These were not small studies. And what I want to do now is to show you one suite of these studies and what we found out. So one of the things that we thought about, we wanted to build upon um, uh, uh, um, lessons, if you will, or successes in reproductive health, um, which uh, say that if you allow people options for an intervention that you want to achieve, you are going to achieve wider coverage. Now we said, well, we've got a couple of biomedical prevention options right now. We know some are in the pipeline. Let's test this and let's see if we offer people choices um, uh, across the care that we're delivering, if it makes any difference. So we offer people choice and go back and forth from PEP or PEP, where they got their care, what kind of testing they want, their refill, um, how frequent. We all did this in a patient-centered care model. So Kate Koss, um, uh, really uh, sitting here also, um, really championed a lot of these studies. And I just want to share with you some of the, uh, the, the findings on a high level. So first of all, did people have different choices of what they took? Yes, they did. Did people change over time? Yes, they did. And this was great because this just shows that, you know, people are using the choices. But it kind of doesn't matter if the people are using the choices um, if they're not uh, taking the therapy. And they're not taking the therapy when they are at risk. So what this graphic shows is... Um, there's a horizontal line for every single patient. These are people in the intervention arm, and it's color-coded by whether they report they have HI risk and whether they're taking PrEP or PEP. So if you step back, you can just see that over time, the green zone is people are at risk and they're taking PrEP or PEP and they're reporting and we're going to be um, doing hair studies to see indeed if they were um, taking their medications. More people um, are on medications while they are at risk. And you can also see that people are switching back and forth. So um, these are, um, we did dynamic choice prevention in three settings, the antenatal clinics, the outpatient department, which I just showed you, and in a, a community model. And what we showed indeed that this dynamic prevention approach increased um, biomedical coverage. So this is something that we were planning to put into our big study before we had tested it. So we tested it. Yes, it worked. But it also shows this is great. But if you look at overall intervention coverage, completely inadequate. 28 percent, um, you're not going to do anything with 28 percent coverage. But we have new the really the hottest thing right now in HIV clinical medicine is long acting agents. We have prevention for HIV that you can give every two months. And in January, we are going to be adding um, injectable cabotegravir as a prevention option in this study. And we are really excited to see um, what happens. Okay, back to SEARCH 2.0, our big population level study. Our hypothesis is this precision community health intervention where we leverage essentially things that the government is already supporting and sponsoring. Um, we add in dynamic choice prevention treatment approaches, these new products and interactive data systems that, that will reduce HIV infections, death, and improve health. And we'll do this in a multi-disease model. So what do I mean by precision community health? Well, in essence, it's reaching the right people with the right interventions at the right time. And just some concrete examples of this is using, using data um, for risk stratification, identifying missed opportunities, and maybe in geographic areas um, where you have the opportunity to do more um, intense interventions and telehealth. We are going to be using all of these and testing these as part of the package in SEARCH 2.0. So why is this needed? Well, certainly people in the most need are not engaged in clinic-based services. I remember that graph. We're not um, on, the, on the way to hit that red dot. And this one size fits all is not working. So we are developing right now in um, collaboration um, with the governments of Kenya and Uganda on mobile de um, devices, closed loop data systems, where we will be able to connect data from outreaches in the field, our community health workers, um, and uh, the, uh, the clinic. And just to give you some examples from uh, the data that we've collected over the years, um, one of the things we looked at is the concept of um, uh, population level viremia, where your denominator is not people, just people living with HIV, but all people living in a community. So you can imagine if the level is higher than you, um, if you have an exposure, you have a higher chance of acquiring HIV. And we showed that this correlated um, with HIV incidence. And so this allows you to geographically target your efforts. 
We've also put machine learning um, uh, uh, for PrEP to identify PrEP risk into the field. Um, and Laura Balzer um, uh, from Berkeley, um, we used her data of who's seroconverted, and then she developed a program using super learning and sample approach. And what we show, this is really constrained optimization of problem. You don't want people who don't need PrEP to be taking it, but you want people with a higher risk to take it. So if you ask the question, looking at who you might expect based on the characteristics to zero convert, which is better? Just picking a demographic, oh, we're gonna give PrEP only to young women or to do um, a, a clinical prediction role. It turned out that this machine learning actually was the most efficient approach. Um, uh, we have done this in the field. People write review articles about this, always talk about doing it, um, but actually we're one of the few groups that has done it and we will be incorporating this into our search 2.0 study. So we're gonna be starting that hopefully um, in March of uh, uh, 2023. So now um, um, I'm gonna talk about San Francisco and Steve talked a little bit about this in the, in the introduction. So I won't repeat this. Um, uh, one of the things that um, happened in San Francisco and this shows our bringing together uh, uh, community policy makers um, and scientists all together. This is the picture Steve showed from Car Auditorium where Steve and I are sitting there, Steve Follinsby who's the head of HIV at Kaiser and um, uh, Brett here. I was interviewed in the New York Times uh, article that was written about this when, um, you know, once again, the theme is San Francisco has gone rogue, but in fact, we should have been doing that. We were doing that. We did this two years before everyone else changed their guidelines. So um, after the International AIDS Conference in 2012, we routinely have meetings with the community to report back what happened. Um, Jeff Sheehy, who was working in communications um, at UCSF at the time, a community member, a man living with HIV, Susan Buckbinder, world-class um, HIV uh, vaccine researcher, also faculty at UCSF. Um, we developed the program, uh, we had great attendance, and we we're just talking about all these things we were gonna do after the meeting. And then this person in the front row raised their hand and they said, well, this is all great, but are you working together? And it turns out, actually, at this time, we really weren't working together. It wasn't because we didn't want to work together. It was we were also pursuing our passions at such an intense pace. We've kind of lost track for that. And because of that, we established this Getting to Zero, which is a freestanding public-private community academic consortium. Um, we operate under the principles of collective impact. Everybody has their jobs, but we have one common goal, which is getting to zero new infections and near, zero deaths from AIDS. And um, we have an in, in, incredible administrator, Courtney Levy, uh, who runs this. But otherwise, everything in, has done in this group is purely out of volunteerism. It's amazing. There's all these committees. People meet. We have private sector. We have academics. We have people from the health department. Um, we designed these um, committees to address our three first goals, was to ramp up PrEP, uh, make sure that at all our clinics in San Francisco, we were doing treatment upon diagnosis and to strengthen the um, uh, cascade. So, um, you know, this is an ecological observation. We can't really say this is cause and effect, but this is a graph which shows the HIV cases in San Francisco. Um, when we started getting to zero San Francisco um, and the, the, the most um, recent um, numbers. Now, if you put a red line on this graph, which showed the cases of HIV, um, in the United States, it would practically be flat, okay? And it really was by putting together all these interventions and actually taking the science and putting it into action that we were able to achieve this. Well, under 60 cases is certainly not good enough. Looking at our epidemiology, um, we now be getting to 0 2.0. Um, over 50% of our cases are among persons um, of color. Highest percentage of um, new diagnosis are in the Latino community and also very high prevalence uh, of the number of new, new diagnosis in the homeless and person who use drugs. So we have a whole new set of um, uh, committees for getting to zero. Ward 86 is really really pioneering some innovative programs that um, are addressing um, some of these gaps. And we're really excited about the, the future of getting to zero. So I don't know what the nth flight of steps is. As I mentioned, um, uh, uh, we've got next generation treatment and prevention. Not only do we have these injectables, there's an entire new um, development pipeline for new products that, um, uh, that really could just transform HIV treatment globally. Um, our scientists are working on HIV cure and vaccine, and who knows, maybe Precision Community Health will contribute to this. So, um, 
Now, um, uh, for the uh, uh, final part of my talk, um, the, um, uh, the organizers um, asked me to talk a little bit about COVID. So I'm going to call this um, sprinting up the COVID staircase, really kind of the same principles, run towards the fire, went towards the fire, um, uh, understand, prevent, and treat the virus. Um, certainly in the 21st century, the development of these vaccines is just truly the most remarkable um, accomplishment. So when COVID came around, um, we, um, building on our lessons from HIV, we reached out to the community, the Latino task force, and um, uh, a group of us, um, Karina Marquez is now co-leading this, uh, Unidos and Salou, and Joe DeRisi, we could have not done this without Joe and his lab, has just been a magnificent um, a collaborator um, bringing into the molecular epidemiology into this work. So we started this because we saw in the hospital that the, um, uh, uh, the percentage of Latinos who were getting COVID was uh, much higher than people who had other diseases. And we knew that the hospitalizations were the tip of the iceberg. So what we knew that we needed to do was to get data of what's happening in the red part of this pyramid to drive solutions. Um, so we created um, this um, uh, task force and the first project that we did was really um, to do um, an epidemiologic study um, in the Mission District in San Francisco. Um, Gabe Chamey um, really led this um, effort. Um, we selected a census tract in the mission, about 4,000 people. When everybody was in shelter in place, we asked people to come out. Um, uh, we were all in the trenches together, the, the community, the, the, the scientists, the laboratory scientists, um, uh, invited people to come to this low barrier, you walk up, you get your test. And um, uh, this is what we found was that Latinos were 24 more likely to have COVID. And um, people um, who, and this was largely driven by the, um, our Latino community were frontline workers and they could not work from home. At this time, one could not even get a test if you did not have symptoms. We knew from viral dynamic studies that that also really made no sense. And we provided the data that show um, that um, testing should be offered of people um, who were symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, we also showed by adding antibody testing that um, the introduction of SARS-CoV-2 in the mission, this occurred across a wide range of demographics and probably due to global travel and income. But then very rapidly, it settled into frontline workers, predominantly Latinx. And um, uh, the Dreesey lab did some really um, beautiful molecular epi work, which um, showed the introduction of the SARS-CoV-2 strains and also showed evidence of um, household transmission, particularly among the multifamily households. So we then went on to do um, a series of implementation science studies. I'm just gonna mention a few of those and um, certainly, we can't just test and leave people high and dry. Um, we wanted to test and make sure that people could isolate. Many people don't have health insurance, and if they don't go to work, they don't get paid. So what we did was we developed a program we called the Test to Care Model. This was community-led, community-designed. Um, Andrew Kirkhoff um, uh, wrote up um, this program, and um, it really helped people uh, with no other resources um, to stay in isolation once they had COVID, and it prompted our city to go during the acute phase of COVID with develop a right to recover, which provided financial resources so they could pay their rent and buy food. So PCR, as you all remember way back, um, um, often um, if one was not in a research setting, it would take days, five or six days to get the results back. And this really, if you're trying to respond to a pandemic, this is really not very practical um, at all. We were um, fortunate to have access to um, a rapid antigen tests, the, the Binance rapid antigen test, which uses lateral flow technology. Um, it detects the presence of nuclear proteins. Um, and um, what we did first was we showed that what the rapid tests do is they detect people with the highest levels of virus who are likely to be most transmissible. Um, it works in symptomatic and asymptomatic people. We We've tested all the variants that have come about. Most of the mutations we care about are on the spike protein, so we would expect them to work, and in fact, um, um, uh, they do. So um, we also show that when you provide people with resources, you do rapid tests, they will isolate. How did we show this? We actually did surprise visits to people's houses just to make sure that they were isolating. Um, one of the most incredible moments of Unidos and Salud is when we first got vaccines. 
And um, we had been studying vaccine attitudes. We were meeting with the community all up in anticipation of getting our hands on these vaccines. And we um, developed what we call the Motivate, Vaccinate, Activate strategy. And what we did in this is we leveraged the social networks of the community. Everybody knows somebody who's not been vaccinated. And people trust people in your tribe, in your social network. So while people were waiting after they got vaccinated, members of the community who were ongoing training, what's the latest in COVID, would, would talk to people and invite them to become vaccine ambassadors and say, you know, this is what I do when I talk to my family member, my uncle who refuses to get a vaccine, this is how I approach it. And then we studied it. We said, well, what happened? And what we showed was this was very effective because people trust their social networks. And over 90% of people reached out to at least one person about being vaccinated and nearly 20% reached out to six or more people. And this just really shows the power of the community. Um, like the, taking the lessons from HIV um, at Unidas and Salud, we are now much more than a COVID pop-up. We do HIV and diabetes testing. This was upon request of the community. We have on-site Paxlovid. And when MPOX came around, um, we offered um, MPOX to people um, uh, who were at risk or had exposures. So what are we doing now in Anitas and Salud? Well, we've almost reached 100,000 tests. We are located in a parking lot behind McDonald's in the Mission District. This is not a fancy place, okay? We are intense, but the music is great. The people are very welcoming um, and many languages are spoken. Um, uh, right now, our positivity rate is about 15 to 20%. Um, we report on our website, Onidas and Salu, the uh, results from uh, Joe's lab. And what you can see, what we're seeing now is an increasing uh, XBB as this is happening across the country and um, the B Q variants. So what are we doing next? In January, we're hoping to launch, we're going to be doing rapid tests for flu and RSV. We really want to understand the intersection of what's happening um, with all these um, respiratory uh, viruses. So that brings me back to the beginning of my talk. Um, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one steps. step. This is, these are the Moraga stairs. I live right um, uh, by these. Uh, these are a beautiful um, mosaic um, staircase. And um, the second part of this staircase is a little bit more treacherous. Um, it goes back and forth. There's no um, uh, mosaics on the upper part. But when you get to the top of the staircase, um, you're at Grandview Park. And it is truly a grand view. So um, with that, um, I want to um, express a gratitude to my family. My husband, Arturo Martinez, he's a UCSF graduate. Um, a physician um, who have been with me every step of the way, my four adult children, um, Becky, Danny, Andy, and Jackie, and as Steve mentioned, the newest member um, of our family, little Emilio. I want to thank all the people that I've had the just privilege and opportunity to work with. Uh, many of my team members are sitting here in the audience and I know many are on Zoom. The leadership at UCSF um, who have uh, so supported my work, San Francisco General, the NIH and Dr. Fauci have really um, uh, supported uh, our work and the San Francisco Health Department and really truly most importantly, our communities and our um, international colleagues. So thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you. Uh, it's not really a strong enough word to uh, express our gratitude for that lecture. There's over a hundred people on Zoom. So I just wanna take another moment for people to applaud. And there's a lot of people putting um, congratulations in the Zoom and I will take out what is again, a completely inadequate yet heartfelt appreciation. This is a plaque. Um, for Dr. Haglier um, in honor of her giving this lecture and receiving the faculty lectureship in clinical science award from UCSF. So let me give that to you. And we, if you're okay, we would love to allow people to ask questions. Why don't you come up and 
Since there are so many people on Zoom, Joey, do you have that other mic? Um, okay, well, while we're getting that set up, we'll have people in the room who might have questions and then we'll go to Zoom. And do you want to go ahead and Diane? And oh, there's here. Mike, there's Mike in the ceiling. So uh, Diane, really amazing. Um, uh, we're all, uh, I think, really happy that Zeke Emanuel made you mad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I think um, that you make, you, you give such a powerful example of how community engaged research can really you know, move mountains. And um, and one, one thing that has always blown my mind is that you're able to pull this off and get, get the funding lined up behind this uh, to do this massive thing. Do you have any words of wisdom uh, for <laughs> how, how, how to do, I mean, what, I mean, I mean, I, I can't imagine what you went through to, uh, to, 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 to pull this off and words of wisdom. For I'm not sure I have any uh, secrets or tricks. I think I'm uh, a very passionate person when I believe in things that I am going to figure out. Um, uh, what is it, the Michael Jordan? There's a wall. Either I'm going to go over it, I'm going to go around it, or I'm going to go through it. And so it's it's really like in medicine, a differential diagnosis. Like, what are the possibilities? And so when we were thinking about search, we're like, who who should invest in this project? Should it really be all NIH? No, it should just be all NIH. So I think one of the things, I think when we try to tackle really big problems, we have to bring together very diverse people. So one of the strategies um, that you saw was that um, we went to the World Bank and we said, you know, this is gonna have a huge I'm not an expert in this, but this is gonna have a huge economic uh, uh, impact. Um, do you wanna join us? Can you join us? So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I would guess to say it's just, um, and then I would have to say when going to all these meetings and with NIH, I was like, like sometimes people criticize you and it's just, oh, but then you like think about it. Oh, that was a really good point. And I think through this, we are always learning and listening um, when we present our data of like how we redirect. And that comes from people um, of all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, there is a funny story I'll tell you about going to the World Bank um, with one of our colleagues who now has a big position at Washington University. And uh, uh, this is the World Bank is a very uh, formal place. And uh, so he said, well, do I have to wear a tie? I don't know. <laughs> now everybody at the World Bank wears a tie. In fact, they wear, I don't really know much about fashion, but they wear very fancy clothes. So uh, uh, Elvin had to go out, get a tie. And then after that, what I did is I actually have a tie in my office just in case, you know, people were visiting. And this, this was their thing, but I don't know. That's the answer to the question. <laughs> Um, so there's, as I said, there's over 100 people on Zoom. A lot of people want to ask questions. And um, Liz, I'll have you ask a question in a minute, but I wanted to just read this comment from Monica Gandhi. She said, um, it's very typical of Diane to give so many people credit in her talk, but all of these initiatives, Universal ART in San Francisco, search the COVID-19 work, getting to zero, were completely sparked by her. She is an inspiration to our division and moves everything along the lines of innovation. And I'd like to ask her about her work keeping bipartisan support of HIV going in Congress. And then she said, especially during the AIDS 2012. I mean, I, I think um, the the AIDS movement um, has had by it was definitely rocky at the beginning, but has had a very, I would say, successful um, bipartisan support. And um, during the AIDS uh, uh, planning, uh, there were a lot of political meetings that I had to go to. And um, these meetings were both with Republicans and Democrats, and they were both very committed um, to the AIDS cause. Now, part of the reason was, um, was that George Bush really had started the PEPFAR program. And, um, but um, it worked and people, um, when the stories were told how people's lives were transformed, it resonated with both parties. I mean, I, I think we're in a difficult situation. I don't know what the chicken and the egg is with the, the current challenges that we face because, um, you know, misinformation, that's not a new concept, okay? I kind of alluded to that, you know, back, it's, we've had it now, it's so much easier now, but I do think that, um, 
uh, uh, you know, parties aren't always going to agree on everything, but when they're in active dialogue, it's a lot easier to respond to a pandemic. And that, in fact, was the case when we rolled out antiretroviral therapy. Okay, we have a question from a Dr. Bob Wachter. Um, wonderful talk, Diane. Based on your reflections on HIV and how things have developed over time, what are the lessons as we think about how to approach COVID over the next decade or so, particularly in terms of how we think about our research agenda? I think there's a lot of lessons. One is this um, bringing together community science and policymakers. Another one is recognizing that pandemics love to amplify disparities. And I think that that has happened in HIV. And when we look at the people who are getting infected now, and that happened um, at record pace in COVID. And right now, I think we're at a really um, uh, uh, concerning juncture because all the investments um, that have had um, in order to um, uh, offer services to everyone, regardless of their insurance or, or socioeconomic class, are being threatened to be pulled away. And in fact, you know, dismantling the services, we've built a lot of currency for trust. People have really stepped up. They've done all these things. What does it say when you just pull out the rug? So, um, and that's, that's a little bit where we're at in HIV. We, we struggle with complacency in HIV. People say, isn't that over? It's absolutely not over. I hope I convinced you of that um, in my talk. But um, we, one thing we know for sure is that investment in research is absolutely critical. We must have ongoing investment in research in HIV. We must have ongoing uh, investment in research in the COVID. The COVID pandemic's not over. I mean, I think I, like what we really need is a vaccine that prevents infections um, entirely. And I am confident that our research community can do that, but they're not going to be able to do that if all of a sudden we say, well, it's just like the flu. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So I do think that um, when pandemics come around, anticipating because of the uh, inequities in our healthcare system, just addressing disparities um, that try to mitigate them up front and um, in investing in research. Great. Well, there's a lot of accolades coming in and people saying thank you so much. A lot of people on Zoom putting up chats. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. But thank you so much, Dr. Havillard. It's so inspirational to hear you speak. And you have the special sauce of having this high impact on science in ways that very few people can and improving lives around the world. So thank you so much for this gift to the UCSF community in your talk. And thank you everyone for being here and attending on Zoom. And this will also be recorded and posted on the Academic Summit website. So again, big thank you. Oh, and thank you for my, there's a reception for those of you here um, out in the hall so we can have more opportunity to talk to Dr. Havler as well. Thank you everyone.